My name is Ingrid Van Beek. I'm an addiction medicine and public health physician. And I've been working in the King's Cross area, well, arguably since when I was a medical student at St Vincent's uh, Hospital in Darlinghurst during the second half of the 70s when heroin overdose cases were really exploding. Big uh, drug problem emerging in that area. Yeah, during the the um, 90s, there was particularly an explosion of heroin use uh, right across the country. Uh, the supply of heroin seemed to be um, unending. Um, the quality was really, really high, and we saw a, a, a mounting rate of overdose deaths, um, culminating in 1999 when it reached uh, over a thousand nationally, and. That was more than the national road toll, so that really sort of put uh, drugs and heroin in particular right on the front page. We've been giving out clean needles to people um, mm -hmm. to prevent HIV. Mm -hmm. But people in the local community, they understood the importance of a program like that. Also, we had these um, illegal shooting, what were called illegal shooting galleries. They were actually sex premises like strip clubs and on the main street where street-based sex workers would take their clients from the street um, and rent a room on a very short-term basis, maybe half an hour, to take their client for the purpose of commercial sex. Um, sex takes longer than injecting um, a drug. So these commercial operations started to increasingly rent the rooms for the purposes of purely injecting. Um, and then they started providing the needle syringes as well. So they were sort of quasi-supervised injecting rooms in a way, because if they didn't emerge after 10 minutes, the, the minder would go and knock on the door. And if uh, nobody uh, Answered, they'd go in and, and uh, call ambulance if necessary if there was an overdose situation. There was a, um, a Royal Commission into police corruption which also found that in King's Cross there was very high levels of police corruption associated with drugs and the sex industry. And um, at that time the, the Commissioner became aware of these illegal shooting galleries and some of these operators of those particular premises were in fact incarcerated in the course of this Royal Commission. Because these premises closed down, uh, that activity moved back out onto the streets. So if anything, there was a perception that the Royal Commission had made it worse. And so the Commissioner actually added a recommendation to his final report saying that the government should consider uh, extending the needle syringe program so he saw injecting rooms as an extension of the needle syringe program so as well as giving clean syringes instead of bidding those people goodbye um, allowing them to stay on the premises and do what they would otherwise do in less safe circumstances and that's always I think the, the best way of framing it and it gives an idea of where injecting centers kind of sit in the continuum of care Meanwhile, the drugs issue was just really sort of um, blowing out all over the place, not just King's Cross. Um, it got so hot, the Premier at that time, one about six weeks out from the next state election, he said, look, if we're re-elected, he said, we'll host a drug summit, um, first thing. And then, um, true to his word, they did um, establish a drug summit. 172 resolutions were passed. One of those resolutions was to establish an injecting centre on a trial basis. Didn't actually say King's Cross, but because we'd been sort of on about this for a while, and King's Cross did have the highest concentration of drug uh, overdoses and deaths in the country, that was the logical place. Importantly also, it was well established by that stage that the community also favoured this type of thing. So the combination of having a problem there, having a community that was, was pretty keen on it, uh, was enough then for uh, the government to um, decide that this trial should take place there. 
and then uh, Uniting Church stepped into the, the void and they uh, agreed to apply for the licence. So under the legislation, legislation had to pass of course to allow all this to happen, which uh, duly happened at the end of that year in 99. And um, I was then recruited as the medical director of that service. Um, so finally we opened in 2001 in May, two years after the drug site. So basically it operates like a needle syringe program giving out clean needles and everything that goes with that. But in addition to that, it accommodates the injecting episode on site. So you come in, you register. It's quite a formal registration process. That was partly for the original valuation, but it also provides a lot of relevant information so you can tailor advice. And right from the outset, people are told what the range of services are, including that the injecting centre can organise referrals to drug treatment and rehab. So they know that right from the get-go, that that sort of assistance is ready and available and they're encouraged, obviously, to use that. And then they go into the second stage where they actually get the needle syringe and are allocated to a booth. They've brought their own drugs, they can ostensibly inject just the once per visit and then they can come back, but then they have to be reassessed for intoxication. So part of the initial assessment in that stage one is to make sure that they're registered, that they're eligible, that they meet the criteria. And yeah, one of the important criteria is that they're not intoxicated because you know, you're not preventing an overdose if you ignore one of the greatest risk factors for overdose and then allow people to proceed to inject more drugs. So that's a very clinical area, the second stage. Um, looks a bit like an emergency centre. And then if there's an overdose that happens there, the staff are all equipped to deal with that overdose. So it's a more clinical model. But yeah, it's different to the European, many of the European rooms, which are more sort of like drop-in centres with a sort of a side room where you can inject so that not everyone there is there to inject. There's everybody that comes to the injecting centre ostensibly there to inject. This was to maximise throughput. We only had one. Uh, we were being formally evaluated. We needed to maximise impact. We also had a lot of other drop-in services in the area. So yeah, we really didn't want to duplicate anything was, that was already there. We wanted to use all of our resources for what wasn't there. And that was an injecting centre. And then they go into the third stage, which is the uh, aftercare stage. That's a bit of a sort of chill out area. People can hang out there. There's again no time limit, but people are sort of not encouraged to hang around there the whole day. So the, the model is very much designed to maximise throughput. So we didn't really provide, other than referrals, limited on-site services otherwise, keeping in mind that yeah, people are almost by, by definition drug affected when they're in the service. So there's always the issue of consent to other health services and whether they even remember. Um, so you've got a limited ability to do much other than crisis counselling. It's not really an appropriate setting for more therapeutic counselling or medical services, but they do have some clinics there, Hep C clinic, um, where they can take blood and check people for Hep C. So once people um, feel ready to leave, they go out through the back door, so it's a sort of one-way system. But yeah, they can if they want to inject again, walk around the block, come back through the front door, get assessed again, and as long as they're not intoxicated, they can start the process again. But the other important thing is, I guess, that potentially you see people sooner. So 
At a health service, almost by definition, the people coming there have a health problem. With an injecting centre, because it doesn't, it shouldn't pitch itself really as a health centre, it's a place that people can come to inject safely. You presumably then potentially see people earlier in the course of things, before they've actually developed health problems. And then, you know, you can start to encourage healthier behaviours and then, of course, nip things in the bud when you, when you see the first signs. So you get the opportunity to see more people earlier and, and direct those people to treatment when we know it works better than when people are completely entrenched in the lifestyle and got a criminal record and all those things. Then the pathway out is much more convoluted.